the 700 Club, a seismic shift in congressional politics. Look what the latest census shows. States in the Republican-dominated South and West are seeing population growth, while those in the more Democratic North and Midwest are falling off. And that could swing the House of Representatives next year. Here's how it shapes up. Texas will gain two seats, while Colorado, Florida, Montana, North Carolina, and Oregon will each gain one. The states losing one seat are Illinois, Michigan, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and California. And the amazing thing is that the state legislatures in, in these, uh, most of these states are controlled by the Republicans, and it means the Republican legislatures will determine the election, which may well flip the House of Representatives and may spare us more socialism in our country. Well, in other news, this is a shocking thing that happened just south, south of us in North Carolina in a town called Elizabeth City. It's close by. Shot in the back of the head multiple times while both his hands were on the steering wheel. That's what 20 seconds of police video revealed about the death of Andrew Brown. His family's attorney is calling it an execution. And in the city of Elizabeth City, it's now under a state of emergency. Charlene Aram is on the ground with this report. After hours of anticipation, the family of Andrew Brown was shown just 20 seconds of footage from one body cam, leaving them infuriated with more questions than answers. It's ridiculous and it's outrageous and so disrespectful to the family to have waited so long, not alone this morning the death of what happened, but to wait this long to get disappointed like that, it's ridiculous. Brown died last Wednesday when deputies opened fire while serving multiple warrants on him for drug charges. Witnesses had previously said deputies opened fire when Brown tried to drive away. But a family attorney says the short clip shown Monday begins with police firing their weapons at Brown sitting in his car, which was blocked by law enforcement officials, making it impossible for him to escape. We do not feel that we got transparency. We only saw a snippet. Let's be clear. This was an execution. Andrew had his hands on his steering wheel. He was not reaching for anything. Calls are growing for authorities to release unredacted footage from other body cameras and any police dashboard cameras, which requires a court order. The taxpayers pay a lot of money for these video cameras to be retrofitted for on police uniforms for this specific purpose. So why is it when it's so critical that we have transparency that they're denying the public from seeing this video? It's above us now. Uh, we need everybody to put pressure on them to show the world what happened. The city is now under a state of emergency, and some fear the peaceful protests will now escalate. Monday night, protesters marched to County Attorney Michael Cox's home, calling on him to resign. They're going to make people do things like um, start being more negative. Everybody's been trying to be positive and be peaceful, but they're making it hard at this point. I just don't want to see, you know, the city have to go out in a riot. Many also calling for County Sheriff Tommy Wooten to step down. I think the sheriff has failed us as, as, as community members. I support his resignation. Local pastors are praying for peace. Right now, we have many hearts that are hurting, and especially from what was heard today. You can feel it in the atmosphere, and so net more now than ever, my first prayer is that God's presence would be in this city in such a great way because in his presence there's healing, there's comfort, there's strength, mm -hmm. there's peace. And so my first prayer is, God, we need your presence here. Meanwhile, Brown's family is seeking justice. I want to see justice for my cousin. Like, I don't care about, excuse me, I don't care about nothing else. I just want to see justice for my cousin. Charlene Aaron, CBN News, Elizabeth City, North Carolina. You know, the thing is, you have to ask yourself, why are they holding the video? They ought to release that immediately. I know it. you have to go through some processes, but that, that video needs to come immediately to see if there's any justification. If it wasn't, uh, you, they need to bring closure and, and discipline the police. 
If on the other hand they were justified in what they did, then the community in Elizabeth City will know the difference. But we need to get that stuff out fast. I don't know why it's always these delays. You have to wait and you wait and you wait and then finally you get an answer. It needs to be done instantly because the mobs are coming instantly. Well, also in the news, stunning allegations against a former Secretary of State. What did Iran's foreign minister say about John Kerry in a leaked audio recording? And why are Republicans and Israelis both up in arms? John Jessup has more. Thanks, Pat. Republicans are calling for an investigation into Ambassador John Kerry. Some are demanding on some are demanding rather for him to resign from the Biden administration. This after leaked audio reveals Iranian Foreign Minister Javad Zarif saying the former Secretary of State told him about more than 200 Israeli operations against Iranians in Syria. The New York Times reports Zarif makes that claim in a three-hour recording. Kerry served as President Obama's Secretary of State, holding in-depth negotiations with Iranian leaders in pursuit of the 2015 nuclear deal. In a tweet, Kerry denied the allegations, calling them, quote, unequivocally false. He is now serving as President Biden's climate czar. President Trump's Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and other Republicans, Pat, are calling for a congressional investigation. Of course, John Kerry is being laughed at now. He was riding like a, a motor scooter, supposedly going to save on climate change, and yet he flies around in private jets that eats up more uh, fuel and pollutes more in the atmosphere than any, any scooter will possibly uh, alleviate. John. Pat, we're learning more about a tense encounter between American and Iranian warships in the Persian Gulf earlier this month. Footage released from the U.S. Navy shows a ship commanded by Iran's Revolutionary Guard cutting in front of the U.S. Coast Guard vessel Monomoy, causing the ship to come to an abrupt stop with its engine smoking. The Navy reports Iran provoking a similar incident with another ship in the region. Well, here at home, California is facing a political shakeup this year. A vote to recall Democratic Governor Gavin Newsom will be on the ballot in the fall. State officials verified more than the one and a half million petition signatures needed. The recalls driven by Republicans angry over Newsom's decision to close large parts of the economy during the pandemic. Well, turning to economic news, Bitcoin's been around for more than a decade, but the word's being tossed around a lot more lately. So what exactly is it? And why are so many major financial institutions adopting it? CBN's Dale Hurd has this look. Just a decade ago, hardly anyone had heard of Bitcoin outside of some technology circles. Today, it's gained widespread buzz and acceptance from some big businesses and major investors. Though Bitcoin has a logo, it's actually a purely online digital currency using computer code, acting as real money for people to make their purchases. It was born after the crash of 2008. Although there had been digital currencies before, none of them ever really gained traction. But over the years, Bitcoin gradually caught on. In 2010, it was worth less than a penny. But in early April, it peaked at nearly $65,000 before falling back. The explosion in Bitcoin's price since last fall has come as major financial institutions are offering it to clients. And electric vehicle builder Tesla made a splash in February, buying $1.5 billion worth of Bitcoin. Not only that... They intend to start accepting Bitcoin for payment when they sell Tesla cars in the future. Richard Lyons of the Berkeley School of Business also said that's the wave of the future. The trend is inexorable. I think that not just with Bitcoin, but other cryptocurrencies, that those will become... Uh, transactable currencies increasingly over the next five years. It's not going to happen overnight. But even as cryptocurrencies gain acceptance, governments like China, the European Union, the U.S. and more are moving toward digital currencies as well, possibly leading to competition for Bitcoin. Regardless of the future of Bitcoin itself, it's clear that it's opened the door for a revolution in digital finance, a revolution that is likely to change the world. Dale Hurd, CBN News. I'm sure a lot of people wish they got in early. For more on the story, let's go, in, go back to Pat. Well, 
if you're as baffled as I am about Bitcoin, and I understand if you lose your coin, your code, you might be wiped out. You wouldn't have any money left, and it's not there in the bank. You've got to have your code in order to get it. But CBN News financial editor Drew Parkhill, Drew, what in the world, what is going on with Bitcoin, and why does it have the potential to change our financial world? Pat, it really does have the potential to change our financial world. It's not going to happen overnight, as the professor from UC Berkeley said. You know, it's going to take time, but more and more people are using Bitcoin as basically a, an alternative money. And it's also, and we don't have time to go into all this, but it has also opened up all kinds of new types of buying and selling and digital um, artwork and so forth that goes for a lot of money. It's, it's just amazing. This has opened up a whole new world. It's gradually filtering down to quote unquote Main Street, so to speak. Most people are interested in it because it's had such a huge run up in price, as Dale showed in his story. The reason the reason it's had such a huge run up is people recognize this is an idea whose time has come and it's got long term implications. I'll, I'll just point out, Pat, uh, back in 1995, you and I demonstrated the Internet yeah. here on the 700 Club for one of the very first demonstrations ever. At the time, you asked me, how's this going to affect television? I said it will replace television. Yeah. Now, at the time, I didn't know that something called cutting the cord was coming, but it did. But this week at the Oscars, Netflix, which didn't exist and couldn't have existed before the internet, won seven Oscars. I think Facebook won an Oscar too. Well, they did win an Oscar for something or other. And so we couldn't have foreseen that. We can't foresee what Bitcoin's going to lead to, but we know this will change everything. No question about it. All right, well look, they, they totally mine it and it's all done with computers. Tell me how the thing, the stuff works. Well, miners get paid uh, in a certain amount of Bitcoin as they bring more Bitcoins into existence. The majority of them have already been brought in. But the important thing is that this is a purely online currency. And the idea is for privacy, you know, so that people won't know what's going on, that they can do just you to me transactions, peer to peer and so forth. The important thing, and this is very important, is that governments are looking to get into the act, as Dale pointed out in his story. Now, I want to show you a soundbite. Now, this is from this is not from just some analyst. This is not from some Wall Street type. This is from Mark Carney, who was at the time the governor of the Bank of England. The Bank of England was uh, built, or not built, but brought into being in 1694. It's basically the model for central banks around the world, like the Federal Reserve. It's their version of the Federal Reserve. He said this in 2019, talking about an alternative to the dollar. This was at Jackson Hole, Wyoming in August of 20, uh, 2019. He said this in an interview on CNBC. Let's take a look. You don't just jump to something new overnight. Um, and the, uh, what we want in a multipolar world, I think we'd agree that we've got European engine, we've got the Chinese engine, we've got the US engine of this economy. Multipolar world, you need a multipolar currency. The question is, how do you get there? And I laid out some ideas of how you would get there. So this is the governor of the Bank of England, Pat, laying out ideas for an alternative to the dollar. We've often talked about what's going to happen to the dollar with problems with it. This is a possibility. Again, not overnight, but this has been discussed for a while now. So this has serious implications well, for the U.S. dollar as well as the rest of the world. You know, we are the reserve currency of the world, and everybody plays off the dollar. Right. So the dollar is the means of exchange. Right. The, um, the Chinese are trying to introduce the renminbi, and it's not really taking hold because there are not enough people that want it. Now, these things, tell me how you get a Bitcoin. You mine it, computers? Well, how do you get one of them? It's getting easier and easier and easier to do that. It used to be really pretty difficult. You had, like you were talking about earlier, you had to get a, you had to get a, um, a, a wallet and you had to make sure you had the code. And there's one fellow who had enormous amounts of money in it because he made so much, but he lost the code and he couldn't figure it out. And so, but it's getting easier and easier to do that. The major financial institutions, J.P. Morgan Chase is now moving to um, open up a Bitcoin investment, a managed account for wealthier clients and so forth. You're going to be able to do it through Venmo, but you know, you don't even, uh, I mean, like you can use a MasterCard and pay it through with Bitcoin and so forth. So there are very important things about this, but the most important long-term implication, there are a couple of them. Number one, if you do have national currencies 
that are digital, like a digital dollar, the government could eventually be able to track everything. That raises huge privacy implications. The other thing, and this is extremely important, is if and when, and let's face it, it's going to be when, when you have a global electronic digital system that's all electronic, that means all buying and selling is done that way, you can be shut out of that system at some point. In other words, you would not be able to buy or sell without permission. I think we've read so that yeah, somewhere, it's Pat. Something like that in the book of Revelation last time. You, you really think that could, that could usher in uh, actually a takeover of the world currency if everybody's in Bitcoin and it can be withdrawn by the governments and that means all the money you've got could be taken unless unless you had the mark of the beast. Is that what you're saying? It, it probably won't be Bitcoin. What Bitcoin did was open the door for global digital currencies, plural, that it will be interchangeable. There may be one eventually. Again, we've just started down the road. We don't know how it's going to get there. We don't know how long it's going to take. It'll probably take decades. It's not next week, but we've opened the door now for the first time. Thanks, Drew. Amazing stuff. I mean, if you're like me, you, you, you're, you're sort of... Uh, but think of having all that money in Bitcoin and losing the code, and suddenly you didn't have your code, and they couldn't get it. You couldn't access it. Oh, my goodness. Well, I, I wish if I'm like you, you say, I wish I'd gotten in when it was selling for a dollar or two before it went to 59000 <laughs> All right, Terry, what we got next? Disemboweled. A beautiful day of boating turned deadly in an instant for Leanne Dorn. She was impaled by the boat's propeller in front of her husband and daughter. Doctors said there was nothing they could do for her. So how did she not only survive, but also leave the hospital after only 16 days? Nothing short of a miracle. I thought her bathing suit had gotten caught and entangled into the prop. And in that moment, I was trying to just help her up. I was like, oh, maybe that's what it is. And then I realized she was drowning. Memorial Day weekend 2019. Phil Dorn, along with his wife Leanne and daughter Chelsea, enjoyed a day of boating with friends in Destin, Florida. Eight of us set out for a little bit of time in the Destin Harbor and Crab Island and, and uh, some of the, the fun spots uh, on the water here in the Destin area. Towards the end of the day, Leanne and Chelsea went swimming one last time. Moments later, Chelsea noticed her mom underwater and began screaming for help. I wasn't real sure what had happened until I got to the back of the boat and saw Leanne um, basically impaled up against the, the back of the boat into the blades of the, of the motor. Leanne had slipped off the ladder and fallen onto the propeller, which was still spinning. They struggled to separate her from the prop before finally getting her back on the boat minutes later. And all I could think about at that moment was, we've taken too long. This is too long of a rescue, too much, you know, and it, it just hit me right then. It, it wasn't happening. My mom was not breathing at all. I gave her two rescue breaths, and in those rescue breaths, she did cough and open her eyes. I felt a slight sense of hope and relief in that moment and immediately just grabbed onto her organs because I knew that we had to keep them in and close to her body as we could. Heartbroken and overwhelmed, Phil turned to God for help. I started praying on the boat when I was holding her up by her shoulders. Um, I, I knew we were in a, a very difficult time and moment. So many thoughts are going through you, but um, you know, I was praying for my wife and I was praying for my daughter and, and uh, and my son, too, because you just don't know what's going on at that moment. They rushed Leanne to shore where they were met by emergency responders. Chelsea called her brother Carl and told him to get to the scene. They blocked off a huge area, and then when I saw the helicopter come in, that's when I kind of realized how serious it actually was. When they arrived at the hospital, they were told the severity of her injuries. And then she said, Mr. Dorn, I, I need to tell you that um, there's nothing we can do for your wife right now. And um, she said she's too unstable, and all we can do is, is try to keep her comfortable. At that moment, all we could do, and, and I told them all we could do is to start to pray and, and, and to get as many people to pray with us as we could. That was the only um, resource we had to help my wife. 
I was texting my really close friends and we contacted family members, they started to pray. And at that point, they reached out to their church groups who started to pray. There were thousands of prayers from all over the world that started to come in for my mom. It was beautiful. Leanne clung to life. She had a collapsed lung from drowning and her kidneys had shut down. Doctors were able to perform emergency surgery, then a second surgery followed that flushed the salt water from her abdomen. Thankfully, her kidneys quickly revived. And we saw firsthand the way that those prayers helped us, and I'm beyond grateful. Before bringing her out of the medically induced coma, doctors did an EEG and discovered birth suppressions, a condition that causes brain damage and eventually leads to death. The family's prayers intensified. I just remember weeping, just begging God that I would do anything if she'd be okay. It was just weird, it was just like all of a sudden, like everything that I was worried about just kind of went away. And, and that was like the first time in my life I actually ever felt more than just saying stuff, like I actually ever felt God. The next day, a second EEG provided a miraculous report. The neurosurgeon came back in the room and said, um, this is unbelievable, but we found uh, no birth suppressions and we can see no damage at this time. And she said, you have to understand this just doesn't happen. Our family doctor told us there's no medical explanation to this, absolutely none. You just witnessed a miracle were his exact words. Leanne soon stabilized. She spent 12 days in the ICU and was discharged on day 16. Her journey hasn't been easy, but all involved experienced the power of prayer and God's goodness during their time of need. I truly know that it was prayer and, and God who saved me, absolutely. I believe it, it, was, it was the faith behind the prayers that God heard and God saved me, and I'm a, a million percent <laughs> happy that I'm still here, yes. Now she gets to meet her granddaughter and gets to be here for weddings and gets to be a part of things that I thought I wasn't gonna get to have my mom for. When you ask me how is she today, I think she's fantastic um, because I remember that moment. I remember those moments. For me, it, it's miraculous to see where she's come from, um, from that moment in ICU to what I see now. We, we all realize that it was God that performed all these things, and we were fortunate to be a part of it and, and to see it. Nothing is impossible for God. What an incredible story. No medical explanation. Yeah. Listen, folks, today is the day of prayer that we have. We have a week of prayer, and you have sent us thousands of your prayer requests and we're surrounded by people who are praying. Somebody has got Lyme disease. They've, they've had it for 30 years, and they ask for prayer. Somebody has a healing of an inoperable stage four brain cancer, which is called glioblastoma, mm. and God is able. Somebody wants the whole family, ch ch children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren to find the Lord. Somebody says... I want to pray for peace in Jerusalem and Israel. This is a person <coughs> saying, I need a full-time job. I was laid off in April of 2020. Someone else saying, please pray that I would break free from pornography and my marriage would be saved. Someone else saying, I need deliverance from meth and marijuana addiction. And here's one for healing of glaucoma that's causing me to lose my eyesight. Mm. Uh, we, as I've said, are surrounded by prayer. We have a whole tray of these things if we get them up closer. All right, here you go. I can't, uh, they're in the lip on them. I can grab hold. All right, there they all are. Now, we're going to lay hands on your prayer requests, and we're going to ask God to do something for the audience right now. So Terry and I are going to join hands together. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We praise you, Lord, for everything you've been doing. We thank you for the answers to prayer. We thank you for the miracle we just heard about 
no medical explanation, yes. but you are all powerful. And we acknowledge, Lord, and we praise you and we worship you. Somebody is having grand mal seizures, epilepsy, and God has just healed you. The name is, I want to say Jehoshaphat, but that's not, it's sort of like Jehovah or something. I can't think of exactly what your name is, but you're being healed right now in Jesus' name. Uh, Terry? Someone else, you have a condition, a, a really unusual condition that's causing you to lose your hearing just a little bit at a time, but now you've had significant loss. God is restoring your hearing to you. Put your hands on both of your ears right now and be healed Amen. in Jesus' name. Thank you, God. Father, we praise and we worship and we adore you right now. We thank you that Jesus lives. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And we pray now. Thank you, Lord. We thank you. So somebody's got a muscle weakness. There's, there's, there's something in your chest, uh, whether, whether it's your, your muscles across your chest or whether you were crushed in some fashion, but just put your hand there in the name of Jesus. Touch them. Yeah. Terry? Uh, people with deteriorating diseases, like uh, the muscle scenario that Pat talked about, but other things as well. God is just healing those diseases right now. Put your hands up and begin to thank Him and praise Him, and then walk in that healing in Jesus' name. Against somebody with we've got epilepsy, and and God is is just touching and healing you. You find the power of God going all through your body. Now, Father, we pray for America. Yes. We pray for what we're talking about. We 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 see a cry of this nation for freedom, and we pray that you will set us free and keep at bay the forces of evil that want to destroy this nation. We pray for America, Lord. We pray for this country. And we thank you. This belongs to you. And we give you the praise and, and assert your authority over the United States of America. It's still your country. Take it back, Lord. Take it for yours. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And amen. Okay, Terry. Well, we're going to be praying for the request that you sent us all week long. And we want you to know there's still time to call us if you have prayer requests you'd like us to pray for. Our number, as you know, is toll free. It's 1-800-700-7000. Or you can visit CBN.com and send your request in that way. Plus, we invite you to join us for our week of prayer chapel. Jack Graham, the senior pastor of Prestonwood Baptist Church in Plano, Texas, is our featured speaker today. All you have to do is log on to CBN com at noon for the live stream and I know you'll enjoy that. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. President Biden is supporting the push for D.C. statehood. Critics say it's part of a power grab by Democrats, since it almost certainly would mean adding two Democrats to the Senate. Even though the Constitution puts the district under congressional rule, White House Press Secretary Jennifer so uh, Jen Psaki said Biden endorses the change so D.C. residents will have representation when it comes to taxation and other issues. Well, the right to carry a gun is in the crosshairs of the Supreme Court. The nation's highest court now set to consider a major gun rights case over the right to carry a firearm in public for self-defense. This case involves the upholding of New York's restrictive gun permit law. The timing of this decision comes after a string of mass shootings and will be the first gun rights ruling from the court since Justice Amy Coney Barrett joined the 6-3 conservative majority bench. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Severe depression and anxiety. That's how the pastor of one of America's megachurches responded to prostate cancer. And no one was more shocked at his response than he was. Jack Graham says he felt like a dead man walking. So what did he do to reignite his life? Take a look. Dr. Jack Graham has long been the pastor of the megachurch Prestonwood Baptist in Plano, Texas. While dealing with prostate cancer in 2009, Pastor Graham slipped into severe depression and anxiety. He describes himself then as a dead man walking. With so many people suffering from depression during the pandemic, Pastor Graham shares how he and we can be fully restored in his new book, Reignite. Please welcome to the 700 Club, Pastor Jack Graham. It's nice to have you with us today. Good morning. 
Tell us what it was like for you at the very beginning when you heard that you had cancer. Well, I was confident, actually. Uh, we caught it early, and uh, I was believing God for the best, went into the surgery expecting a quick recovery. In fact, um, I pushed myself right back into the pulpit, which was a mistake, a couple of weeks after surgery and felt I was doing fine on my way to recovery. And uh, then the sleeplessness hit, uh, the anxiety and resultant depression that came and, and truly took me down in a way that I had never expected. Uh, I'm a confident guy filled with faith, and I'd never been sick in my life. I'm talking about really never been sick. The next thing you know, I have this cancer. Then there were questions as to whether we got it all or not. And it just threw me uh, into a place that I'd never been before. And uh, so I described some of that in, in the book and, and how God brought me through and reignited my life. And, you know, today, here I am these years later, uh, just uh, excited about life, full of energy. You know, one of the things depression lies to you about is to tell you you're never going to be okay again. I'm yeah. really probably talking to a lot of people who think I'm stuck like this. It's never going to change. I'm going to be like this the rest of my life. And, and certainly there are people who deal with depression for a long, long time. Well, but Jack, there's hope. You actually got worse before you got better, which took a full year. What was what you call the rope you used to climb out of that depression? Truth. Mm. Truth. Uh, the truth of God's word. Because clearly this is a, not only a, a disease of, of the brain, it's a disease of the body. That's why I said I felt like a dead man walking. It just slows you down. And in some way, that's a, that's a blessing. If you're revving and you're stressing and, and there's pressure and the anxiety, your body, your brain has a way of shutting down to keep you from let's say, running off the road. But I hung on to the truth of God's word. And I don't just mean um, contemplating, you know, getting better. I meant, I mean, contemplating God and giving thanks to God. And in the midst of, of days when I could barely concentrate, reading and meditating upon God's word, giving thanks, uh, even in the midst of this darkness. And it is a severe God. Uh, darkness and ultimately became a severe mercy to me. Oh, you have a friend that suggested that you see someone professionally. You know, I yeah. think for a lot of people, Pastor Jack, that that says there's something wrong with me and it, it pushes them away from help. And for men especially, really? that seems hard. What was that no experience doubt. like for you? Uh, humbling because yes, uh, I'm, I'm the kind of guy that thinks I can fix most anything. Uh, that's what a lot of us men, we see ourselves. And so to admit this kind of weakness, it, it felt like uh, in some ways I was not strong enough spiritually or mentally to deal with this. But I would really encourage everyone who's, who's facing a mental crisis. And we have this going on in America right now. This is I'm calling this now my COVID book because it was written in the middle of this crisis. And we know we not only have had a medical crisis, but a mental health crisis. And so many people are struggling and the struggle is very real. And I really urge everyone to find professional counsel. I, I went to a therapist and uh, talking with this man who strong believer himself, but yet someone versed in, in how to get through the day, how to get through uh, the depression. Uh, it was extremely helpful to me. Talk a little bit, if you will. You write about it so well in your book, what it means to meditate on Scripture, because I think as believers, we all know that truth is in the Word of God, that we need to go to the Word of God. But the way you meditated on the Word of God really had a powerful impact. Yes, uh, very important to memorize Scripture, and uh, but beyond memorizing verses, to think deeply, uh, to cogitate, if you will, uh, upon God's word, to turn it over and over in your mind. And, you know, one of the things is uh, we were saying earlier that depression does, I mean, it, it clowns your thinking, it, um, you can't concentrate as well. But the one thing I could do was to meditate upon scriptures that I had memorized a long time ago, or just to open my Bible and find of course, in, in the Psalms, yeah. uh, David was often disturbed, troubled, and even depressed. And so many of these Psalms are written right to us in a condition uh, like I was experiencing. And so I just lived 
uh, in God's word. And, and that means to meditate, to turn it over and over, to concentrate and to focus on Christ and his word. You talk about some of the swaps that we can make in our lives when these unexpected uh, challenges hit us that will reignite. Share that a little. Yeah, that's the bulk of the book. You know, I spend uh, the first, I don't know, 50, 60 pages, you know, talking about my experience and how we got through it. But, but the book is really about enduring faith and persevering. And yes, making uh, decisions uh, to choose truth over lies, for example. Uh, when one of the things, one of the lies I kept hearing in my head is, you're never going to get over this. You're never going to get through this. You're stuck like this. But when you meditate on God's word, when you concentrate on God's truth, you begin exchanging uh, truth uh, for the lies. Uh, I talk about changing faith for fear. I mean, ultimately, my problem was fear. Uh, I, I, it was anxiety. I didn't know if I was going to get well, if I was ever going to be the same. I didn't know if the cancer was going to kill me. So I had to swap uh, faith, uh, fear, and faith. And in other words, to, to believe and trust in God. Yeah. I was just preaching this Sunday on this subject. I mean, the one thing, the one thing that uh, God asks of us is our faith yes. to believe him and trust him. And uh, so peace for worry. And, and so that's the bulk of the book. We just talk about how to get help yeah. from God's word in times like these. And today you're healthy. Yes, absolutely. Cancer free and you know, our church is responding so well to the to the coming out of the pandemic, and, and I'm just full of God, full of the Spirit, full of joy, and that's the promise. There is, as the mm -hmm. psalm says, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Amen. The book is called Reignite, friends. It's available wherever books are sold. Pastor Jack is also today's featured speaker at our Week of Prayer Chapel. So be sure to join us. Just go to cbn.com. That's at noon Eastern time. Pastor, thank you so much for being with us. Great message. Very welcome. Thank you. Deadly and destructive, Hurricane Laura wrecked havoc when it made landfall in Louisiana last August. Before the storm hit, the Arduin family evacuated to save their lives. But what happened to the home they left behind? Take a look. Hurricane Laura was a Category 4 when it struck Lake Charles, Louisiana. Many people's lives were spared because they evacuated. But when they returned home, they found themselves in another type of storm. Georgiana Arduin's home was heavily damaged inside and out. There was trees everywhere. There was devastation everywhere. It was horrible. It looked horrible. The family's insurance took care of their home, but with limited income, they had no idea how they were going to remove all the downed trees and other debris. Then Operation Blessing arrived. First of all, I couldn't even believe it. And then it was such a warm, welcoming feeling. It was so many of you and you came prepared to work. You had your own wheelbarrows, you had your own saws, you had your own everything, rakes, and y'all just got after it. You just started working. Volunteers removed all the downed trees, shingles, and other debris in a matter of hours, something that could have taken Georgiana and her family months to do on their own. I want to thank everyone who has given to Operation Blessing. I'm so very grateful for you. Thank you so very much. And I don't want to cry, but that's, that's how I feel. I'm, I'm just that grateful. One life at a time. Can you imagine what it would be like, though, if you're living in a, in a house that's just devastated by a terrible hur hurricane, and you've got debris all over your house, uh, all over your yard, your trees are down, and you say, how am I ever going to get it? How am I going to take this stuff away? And <laughs> the answer was you call on God, and God talks to his people and says, okay, Operation Blessing, get in gear and go get them. And so we're helping, we're helping and helping, and that's the joy of, you know, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And we are able to give help of people like the ones in the, the Ardoin family and, and down at Lee Charles, but people all over the country, they're, they're starving, they're hurting, they're, they're in trouble, and we're there for them. So if you want to be part of an army of thousands of people that makes a difference in this world, 
I ask you to join the 700 Club. It's easy. It's $20 a month, 65 cents a day. We're not talking about huge amounts of money, but if everybody gets together, then it becomes huge amounts of money. So I will ask you right now, pick up the telephone, call in 1-800-700-7000. And when you call, it's going to be my joy to give you a copy of my book called I Walk with the Living God. And the comments of this are just fantastic. It's a book of faith. It's a book of triumph. It's a book of overcoming problems. Uh, it's a book of... Uh, well, insights, and it's brutally frank, and some terrific pictures. Uh, here I am with my friend Ben Kinchlow and this early 700 Club. And here I am with Richard Nixon and, and uh, Yekiel Eckstein. And, and uh, here I am talking to President George Bush in the Oval Office. And we just had all kinds of time. Well, I've got another great comment yeah, for please. you. This is Melva, who lives in Viradale, Washington, who says, thank you for writing I Have Walked with the Living God. It's truly inspiring, informative, and educational. I loved your simple honesty. It was difficult to put down. It was that good. I like those comments. <laughs> all right, it's available to you when you join the 700 Club. And also, you can get these things on Amazon or wherever books are sold, so they're available in the marketplace. And I'm very, very pleased that many, many people are buying that they were out of stock and now they've, they've replenished it and uh, they're filling the pipeline. And so they're, it's, it's available in Walmart and all kinds of places that have books. Okay. Time for your email questions. Pat, this first one is from Fredna who says, Pat, in 1997, I was married. My husband and I divorced and I remarried. Since then, I divorced my second husband and reconciled with my first husband. In God's eyes, am I sinning? Oh. Uh, <laughs> wow. Yeah, you know, if you go back to the Bible, we're told that if a man divorces his wife, he can't go back to her again because it, quote, humbles her. But you, you thought it was a good deal. You liked being married to the first husband, and somehow there was a divorce, but you got back together again. And, uh, hey, I, I think it's okay. I, I think you, you say, am I sinning? Well, I, I don't know what the reason for the second divorce was, but there needs to be some ground. But uh, assuming you have biblical grounds, I, I would enjoy your life, okay? Okay, this is a viewer who says, I'm battling with depression and anxiety. I've prayed and declared scripture over it, but it won't go away. How do I know if this is a mental illness that requires medication or if it's an attack of the enemy and I just need to see a Christian counselor? Um, I think what you may need is a medical doctor. I tell you, depression many times has has a, uh, a, a medical cause, and you may need some antidepressant medicine to, to help it. I, I don't know for sure whether it's some, but I, I would ask yourself in your life, are you sinning against God? Are you rebelling against God? Is there something you've done that's wrong? And if it is, if that's weighing on your heart, well, confess that and put it away. But, um, and that may alleviate some of your problems. But it may be that you have a clinical problem uh, and it's, it's chemical and you need a little help in that depression. And I wouldn't feel ashamed to get it, okay? This is Marie who says, Pat, my husband and I raise our children in a Christian home. Today's society teaches them it's a me world and technology is everywhere. We're struggling with them about helping with chores and having responsibilities. What would the Bible have to say to struggling parents up against technology addiction and non-cooperation? You know, Stay you ask me what the Bible <laughs> says. Here's what the Bible says. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of reproof drives it far from him. You know, in the Old Testament, honestly, if a kid was rebellious after a long period of time, the parents would bring the child before the judges and say, this child is uncontrollable, what can I do? And the judge would say, well, what you're going to do is execute him because we don't want to have the problem. In all seriousness, they didn't put up with that stuff. And I think that today's society is so permissive. We let kids do anything they want to do. But when a child is young, you've got to bring him up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. 
and the rod of reproof. You, you know, we, we've got these rules now. You can't use corporal punishment and so forth. That's nonsense. That's, that's not biblical. I, I think child abuse is awful. I want to say that clearly. Child abuse is terrible, and children should be taken away from them. But I think in terms of, of the correction, children need correction. And they know they've done something bad. And, the, you know, if you had just a little whack on the bottom, you say, okay, it's all forgiven now, and the stuff goes away. You know, but they've got to know that they've done something wrong because they feel it. And if you've got guilt in your heart, you've got to have that guilt expunged. All right. Next question. This is Fred who says, Hi, Pat. Politicians and the media call Afghanistan our longest war. I think Korea is because a peace treaty was never completed. We have been in a state of armed truce since 1953. I would like to hear your opinion on this. Um, I was with the 1st Marine Division in Korea. I served in a place called uh, Chando Ri. It was around a place called North Korea, uh, the Punch Bowl, Heartbreak Ridge. Uh, I was over there for a while. Uh, it's mighty cold, and the answer was, uh, when MacArthur took over, um, he wanted to go all the way to the Yalu, but there's some thought that he wanted to go and start a war with China. The, the, the jury is out as to whether MacArthur was right or not. But there's one thing for sure. If we had sealed off Korea at the time, we wouldn't have the problem we have with North Korea. So it's still going on with the problem with the... Kim Jong-un and his family, all right? Mm -hmm. This is Fred who says, hi, Pat Powell. Oh, I'm, that's the one I just read. Sorry, Sharon wants to know, how does she make a real change? She doesn't like anything that's happening. She says, when I vote, everything I vote for fails. Everything I want for our country, which is a biblical return to God, has failed. It looks like the cup of God's wrath must be filled in his timing for the end is here. What resistance can I have if this is God's will? Uh -oh. I, 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 I think you're reading too much into it. I think what you need to do is serve the Lord and know that your light will shine and do what you can to let people know what your point of view is and then get out and work. Work and knock on doors and make telephone calls and get involved in, the, in party politics and do something. Well, thank you so much for those questions. I think that's all the time we've got. And for Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson and Lord willing, we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. from CBM Films. In the summer of 1864, one of the wealthiest women in England decided to take a trip. Baroness Angela Burdett Coots belonged to one of the world's oldest banking families. She was a philanthropist to whom Charles Dickens dedicated one of his novels, a London socialite whose circle included the royal family. And without realizing it, she was about to introduce the world to the archaeology of the Bible. Holy Land fever swept through Britain, and the Baroness even convinced her friend Vicky to sponsor the new organization. Vicky was none other than Queen Victoria. And in 1867, the Queen sent a team to Jerusalem to excavate the Church of the Holy Sepulcher and the Temple Mount. Get written in stone, House of David, for a gift of any dollar amount.